I was going to try to go to law school. That was kind of my game plan. So we opened up at 6 in the morning and called it the sermon, and nobody showed up. First one was kind of um, chaotic, but I got it mm -hmm. off the ground. And then um, I think that year, the third one that we did, the Halloween one, really kind of seemed to, to go to the next level because we had we had Dead Mouse and Crystal Castles, but we, we also had Justice and Too Many DJs. Producing a show isn't really my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's just like somebody's got to do it, so. <laughs> Hi, this is Lauren. I'm here with Destructo. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> so you were actually born in D.C., right? Yep, Washington, D.C. Were your, your parents born there as well? Yep. And then even from like a young age, your dad was like, radio and like doing concert stuff yeah my dad's always been in music so when my brother and I we were born we were just born into pretty much a concert yeah <laughs> at a radio station just always around music and you had people like say over right like Alice Cooper and people yeah like weird like Wolfman Jack Ted Nugent like just you know I think when people were in, in the, the Maryland DC area they would kind of hang with my dad what about your mom then my mom was into music too, you know, she would always drive us around the car, play lots of disco and funk and R&B, but uh, my dad was kind of more like in the in the industry. Yeah. So, but my mom was 100% music as well, so it was just her her side of the family, her uh, uncle and brothers, they all played like jazz musicians. Oh. Her, her brother played uh, stand-up bass, Uncle Ronnie. He played bass with uh, like Liberace and Pearl, oh. Pearl Bailey and like a lot of a lot of jazz artists up in up in New York. Yeah. So yeah. what was her job then? Uh, she was just a mom. Oh, she was just a mom. Yeah. mom. <laughs> How would you describe herself back then, growing up? Um. Well, I mean, I don't know. I was just like a little kind of crazy kid, like playing out in the woods and just being a kid. Yeah. Were you into school back then? Into school? Yeah. Um, not so much. I mean, I think school, school always for me was like, it was just, I don't know. I never found anything like interesting, but it wasn't like, it didn't excite me. I couldn't figure out like what I wanted to get out of it. Yeah. You know, so I never really applied, I never applied myself to it mm -hmm. the way I probably should have. Was music your favorite subject, or did you have like favorite subjects? I didn't think then? we had music in school. Oh. I like PE was pretty yeah. good. You know, I like science. I like math. Definitely, you know, more on like the math side of things. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I should have paid more attention in school, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Do you remember the first CD that you bought? First CD. Um, I mean, I just remember when I was really little. I mean, I loved Kiss. Mm -hmm. I had Kiss, ACDC, stuff like that, like rock, rock. I think when I first started getting into music, it was like rock, rock music. Yeah, and your dad actually had that background, how you mm -hmm. like got into it. Yeah. Was your brother into rock as well? Yeah, just all of us, you know, we were, you know, whatever, whatever, mu my dad always moved with the time, so whatever music was hot at the time is what we, what he was into. Yeah. And then we formulated our own, our own, um, our own tastes. Did you get into like Two Live Crew and like Eric B back then? Yeah, well, when rap when rap came along, you know, um, I mean, my dad played the Rapper's Delight on the radio, mm -hmm. Sugar Hill Gang. I have a platinum record for that. Oh. Just haven't put it up yet, but it's in my office somewhere. But I mean, anything that came along, I mean, we were around it. You know, whatever was current was kind of in our wheelhouse. Yeah. So was rap something that? your dad showed you or did you were you able to like discover a lot on your own too um i mean when i was little i think it was mostly from my i mean i guess friends too but you know i mean when run dmc was new the beastie boys um ll cool j all yeah. that just yeah just through my dad through friends just i guess as being a teenager and i ended up moving to la this is being a teenager in la and driving my car around and yeah listening to tunes even with like the the rock focus, did you consider or were you in a band back then? Um, I was I played drums with me and my brother. We used to always like jam, but I was never really in a band. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah, no. So what actually what clicked to you that you wanted to even do music yourself I mean, before or Destructo, you didn't really, did you put stuff out like under a different moniker? I put some stuff out under Destructo like a long time ago when, yeah. I, when I first started. I put out some records like in the early 90s when I first started DJing, 
but mm -hmm. you know I'm more at heart like my thing is I'm a DJ you know I'm like a DJ producer and so I always collab with different different musicians and artists to work with yeah so for a long time I had like record labels and I would make records with other artists that were signed to my label yeah what um, made your family move to New Orleans um, well my dad moved because of uh, his job so he was, you know, he was on the radio in D.C. and then he went on the radio in New Orleans. Oh, and then like here Same in thing L.A. in L.A. too, yeah. Right. And then between like graduating high school and then doing the sermon, what were you doing in that time period? I went to uh, college. Oh, okay. So I went to college for a couple years and um, for a job I was, I delivered pizza. Oh. And the guys that were delivering pizza with me, all had graduated from college yeah from UCLA and USC so I was kind of like well these guys graduated and they're still delivering pizza yeah and I started doing clubs and DJing and started working so I just decided I'm gonna stop going to school for a while and 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 just do this yeah. instead what was your major that you were on track for at UCLA uh, um, I, w I went to Cal State Northridge oh. I was a political science major oh how did that interest come about I don't know, I just kind of, I didn't really know what I was going to, I was going to try to go to law school. That was kind of my game plan, and um, I thought that would help me. I don't know. I was just trying to find what I was interested in. Yeah. But. What about I, I political never science? I mean, you didn't really have, like, family around you who were in that field that guided you, right? So how did, no, how did that spark to you? I have to figure out a good route. Um, I don't know. I just thought, you know, government, you know, learning about politics and all those things would be a helpful skill to have um, if I was going to be an attorney. Did it occur to you back then that you could see a career in music, whatever it may I be? I mean, I kind of assumed that I probably would be in music at some point just because of my family's history, but yeah. I really kind of wanted to do something different and then I just got sucked in. And how did the idea for the sermon came about like way back, or why did you even want to like start throwing events um so what what happened is is we would have people come to our apartment mm -hmm. after like the late night like saturday night parties and um kind of mess up our apartment yeah and so my roommate was always pissed because he didn't want to uh lose his security deposit oh. so we thought we would take some people down to the bar down the end of the street instead of at our apartment and so in, in California, you can start serving alcohol again at 6 in the morning. So we opened up at 6 in the morning and called it the sermon, and nobody showed up. Yeah. <laughs> no one showed up for a couple weeks, but then it started to kind of pick up, and it kind of became a thing. Yeah. What did you realize back then you kind of had the personality to be able to do these events or, like, characteristics? Did you realize, like, oh, this is, like, something that suits me and like I could really do well in this um I didn't really think of it like that I just more thought it's just kind of, I don't know I like to throw parties yeah you know I was born on New Year's Eve and I just <laughs> like to give people a good time and so it just kind of it just came natural plus I'm pretty organized and I'm pretty mm. um you know I have a pretty good drive for getting things done so it just kind of fit fit me yeah you know it's kind of a natural fit to be able to like bring all those elements together did your dad kind of mentor you at the beginning no 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 advice from him <laughs> no he didn't even know what I was doing what well yeah the first event started at six in the morning so you know he, <laughs> you know he was already like upset with me that I was involved in electronic music because that music back then nobody cared about it you know, there was no um, no radio play, no no lyrics, no. no it just wasn't commercial. Yeah. My dad's always my dad's always about what's current, like what's hot. You know, like he was on the radio, so he would he would switch oh. genres depending on what was like popular. And so for me, I just found this genre to be, resonate with me, not not because it was going to be successful I just like the music yeah I just like the sound of the music you know I didn't really care if it was popular or not what kind of music was playing at the sermon during that time um I I DJ'd a lot of like RNS records um XL recordings Joey Beltram 
um, a group called Eon 808 State. Like I just played a lot of really abrasive techno music or electronic yeah. music to try to keep people awake. What was that the, was the scene of electronic music like in LA during that time? Um, there was a pretty good underground scene, you know. You know, you'd have to go find the party. So you'd go down to Melrose and give someone 20 bucks and they'd give you like a map. And then you'd ha take the map and then you'd have to go try to find where the party was. Oh, yeah. So it was like a goose chase, you know, to, to get in, but it made it exciting. Yeah. And fun. And then kind of soon after they started the uh, what, magical, the water park one. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah, I, I partnered with a guy named Mr. Kool-Aid who was doing his events were called Double Hit Mickey. And so we partnered up and we did uh, Mickey's Holy Water Adventure and we did the uh, Mickey's Electric Daisy Carnival and events like that. Yeah. And then was it kind of soon after that that um, you connected with Rick Rubin? Yeah, so I did, I did a bunch of events in 91 and 92 with Kool-Aid. And then throughout those couple years, Rick Rubin would come to all the events that we were doing or come to a lot of them and he asked me if I knew anyone who would want to work for him and do A&R and so I told him I'd do it and then he hired me so at the end of 92 I start I, in the beginning of 93 I started working for him yeah and stopped doing uh producing like underground parties yeah. in LA and then you're kind of known as like technology right like everyone else was listening to something else in the office and you were known yeah. as more of like the electronic guy yeah, his nick their nickname they gave me was Techno Boy. Oh, Techno Boy. They called me Techno Boy. So yeah, they at that time Rick had they had the Black Crows, they had Danzig, Slayer, um, Sir Mix a lot, stuff like that. Yeah, was that the first kind of time that you felt some sort of friction to like you trying to push electronic music and there's like all these other forces kind of be like. <laughs> no, I think there's, it's, it's always like, it's still like that today. Yeah. I think people just haven't misunderstood that they think, you know, electronic music's just like any other kind of music, it's just music. But, you know, I think so many people have it, the stigma that it has, whether it's, you know, people late at night, or if it brings the wrong crowd, or the music's not music, or do, who makes the music, you know, are these people really musicians? Like, there's just always something with electronic music there's always bullshit surrounding yeah. it you know and during that time a lot of the electronic acts you were pushing like weren't able to sell records right yeah none of them sold any records <laughs> but people were still listening to it were they downloading all the music illegally then the no artists? they didn't they didn't have downloads then they just never there was no um there was no n there was no way to promote the music because it wouldn't get on the radio and like mtv wouldn't play it like none of those None of those outlets would play the music, so yeah. no one even knew it was out. But they had their own fan bases, right? Not really. Not back when I worked for Rick. I mean, oh. they did. They did like in other parts of the world, but not so much. Like we signed Sven Vath. Like we had him signed in his label, Hard House and IQ. But in America, there's just no audience for it. So it was very hard to market and sell music to an audience that didn't know what it was. Yeah. At that time. You know, now everybody knows Sven Bath is like the, you know, techno guru of the world. But in 1993, people were like, well, who's that guy, you know? So mm -hmm. it's kind of funny. Yeah. And then I guess soon after you started your own kind of label, right? Yeah. So I started my own label. It was called 1500 in uh, 1997. And um, same thing put out a lot of really good records but they didn't really sell you know they weren't uh i never really had any hits is the yeah. word that or, you know you need some hits where do you think you got the confidence from like even during those years that it wasn't going well but you kind of like knew it in you that someday like everything would work out for like the electronic music i mean i didn't really i don't know i didn't really think it would work i didn't know yeah. i just liked it you know i just did i just did what i what i felt instead of what i thought was going to be commercially successful mm -hmm. I think is the way to look at it yeah and then you were kind of working with your brother like during that time right yeah so my brother he managed Slipknot and so he at the time he got sick and so I kind of went just to help him with what he was doing for like four years and he had one year I think we had nine bands on Ozfest yeah 
So he had mud vein, hate breed, and just, just a lot of a lot of metal. And then after that time, I think you started doing your own events again, right? Yeah. So in like 2004, 2005, I kind of realized that people don't buy record music. Yeah. And they definitely don't buy electronic music. So if I was going to try to still have a career in in music that maybe I'd try and sell a ticket and do a concert instead of making a record and then that's when I started hard. How were you even able to like get people to come to these things like you weren't the records weren't like getting to those people so how did they know about the artists? Well in 2007 I had you know MySpace Oh. and before that I didn't have anything like that so we had MySpace and you know you were able to you know sling an mp3 around pretty easily so it st I, st I built my own little network of of people to promote the music to and um, kind of had a way to get get it to them finally yeah how would you describe the electronic scene back then like the audience that came to these shows well before I started hard it was mostly like a lot of the LA music scene was it was like trance and things like that and then um, I started putting in like Crystal Castles and Boys Noise and Justice and music like that and then it just it, it you know it was it was just a crowd of people that all liked the same kind of music they just were never really brought together it was just kind of like it was like it all happened at the same time like it was just like a birth yeah in like 2007 I don't know it's funny because everyone that I work with has all just had recently their like 10 year anniversary yeah. Everybody. <laughs> it's kind of funny. We yeah. all kind of started in 2007, or at least that was a that was kind of a turning point. Yeah. Would you say SoundCloud impacted hard success? Yeah, everything. Facebook, yeah. SoundCloud, Twitter, MySpace, all the digital things that, you know, killed the, the recorded music industry helped me propel the live events because I was able to you know, more than anything, I think when you can just send a file from here to, like, Berlin in, like, a second. Yeah. And then they can, like, remix it and send it back. You know, like, people couldn't do that before that. It was really hard to do that. Yeah. So to be able to just sling music around like that and remix things and edit things and send them to your buddies and mix tapes, it just, it just created a whole, like, network of people that could, could communicate with each other uh, through the Internet. But that all had similar music tastes. Yeah. How would you say the hard fan base has like changed over the years? Were you able to see like different audiences you were bringing in like year by year and like this type of people, that type of people? I mean, not so much. I mean, it just kept growing. You know, I think in the beginning it was very, it was a little, maybe a little older crowd. It was mm -hmm. definitely smaller. But yeah. then just as it grew more and more people realized like, oh, this thing's really cool. Yeah. So. What would you say have been the key moments where Hard was able to gain momentum? Um, well, definitely the first one, because the first one was kind of um, chaotic, but I got it mm -hmm. off the ground. And then um, I think that year, the third one that we did, the Halloween one, really kind of seemed to to go to the next level because we had we had Dead Mouse and Crystal Castles, but we we also had Justice and too many DJs and DJ AM, and it just it, it, it that was the show where we went from like 5,000 people to like 15,000 people. Yeah. But Dead Mouse made a video. Uh, Roops was there of, of ghosts and stuff, and I think it got viewed. I think if you look at it now, maybe it has 20 million views. Yeah. But it, at the time, it had like 500,000 views, and it was like, oh my god, like, can't believe how many people watched that that video of Dead Mouse at Hard Haunted Mansion. The yeah. First one. And then what year was it that you met Skrillex and he requested to be on Hard? Um, I think I met him, it was 2010. Yeah. I was at a birthday party and he told me one of his uh, dreams in life was to play hard. And so I was <laughs> like, okay, let's do it. I didn't even know who he was. But he just seemed like a cool guy. I was like, okay, I never even heard his music or anything. Yeah. And, um, and followed up. <laughs> he, he followed up and thank God, he, you know, thank God we, we bumped into each other. Were there some like mentors that you had like over the years that you were able to like know what to do? Cause from building something from so small to being like the biggest festivals, were there 
people you talk to, people you like ask for advice? Well, I mean, you know, obviously when it comes to the festivals, I mean, I think the first person who really helped me was Bill Silva. And he had a guy uh, that worked with him named Eric Hertz. And Bill and Eric, um, after that first hard, I, I knew I had a, something. I just didn't know how to produce the event the right way. And they kind of helped teach me how to put together a proper budget and hire labor and build a stage and just do all those things kind of like in a more professional manner. Yeah. And then... Um, and then in 2012, you know, in, in 2012 um, is when I partnered up with Live Nation. And there was, there's tons of people at Live Nation that I met along the way that, that helped me. There was a guy, uh, his name was Ford, who was my head of production for most of the time there. And he really helped elevate, elevate my knowledge of producing festivals, you know, producing producing a show isn't really my favorite thing to do mm -hmm. it's just like somebody's got to do it so <laughs> you know it's really actually kind of a pain in the ass really so what, what, what are the what do you like about it I mean well what I like about it is that I like that you bring all these people together and you get to give people a good time you know and, and you get to do something really special and unique but the whole process of, of you know dealing with the city and the fire department and guest list and just just everything about it is just it's really difficult and and um it's 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 not an easy task to do yeah was it, it must have been so much harder to the holy ship and everything then with all those rules yeah well it's just different it's you know it's just like it's like when you buy a house you know like you might have a good view but then there's no closet space you know or you get a pool but then there's only two bedrooms and you need three like it's just yeah. always like a give and take when you're putting these things together on a boat there's just different um elements you have to worry about different things you know that that are different than when you're on land yeah when you came up with the holy ship idea were there other like music kind of festivals happening on boats maybe different genres i mean i think there was like new kids on the block had something and like kiss but I always had the idea because I I'd gone on a on a DJ based cruise yeah in, in the 90s and it was like but it was only like 300 people but it was really fun yeah like anytime you're on the water with good music it's fun yeah <laughs> can't really go wrong how did you come up with uh, like the hard trailers um, well there's a girl named Nagata who I always work with and you know, we were just kind of tired of doing the same old thing. So she had this idea that what if we dressed up all the DJs like dogs? And we had to do two DJs that looked like Justice, the two dogs looked like Justice, yeah. and the one dog looked like a Schaffelstein. And she pitched me on that idea a few times. And finally I was like, you know, let's do something different. We're going to do this video. And... Um, all the people that I work with were like, you're crazy, like, why would you do a video like this? And it just went wild, you know, it went, went viral. Yeah. And it really, um, really kind of changed the game for us. Yeah. And for your own music, you've always been, like, collaborating with hip-hop artists. What was the idea for that? Well, I, after making a bunch of tunes again, I kind of felt like if I was going to do this, why stop at just an instrumental track or a track that just has like a sample that like a sampled hook that we should try and um, try and make a song with a real vocalist and you know take it to the next level you spend so much time on the track so I heard um, I heard a mix from uh, these guys Amni Edge and Dance or, or a song and they had sampled um, they sampled Biggie and I wanted to kind of do a set of all that like like house with rap in it but there really wasn't many records so i felt like okay i guess i just gotta go make them yeah and so the first one i made it was called west coast i made it with um wax motif and we made it like in a night and came out really cool but then it was like all right well we just we sampled dr dre like let's you know we live in la i'm mm -hmm. sure we could find some rappers here and so i got hooked up with yg and then we made party up yeah. And then, because YG was on Party Up, then all the other rappers kind of wanted to be involved, and I started meeting all these different rappers 
um, and going to the studio with them. Yeah, and your new song coming out, how did that come about? Yeah, so I met, uh, I met uh, Yo Gotti a couple times and uh, he said he would come out with me at Hard, at Hard Summer and, and perform. So we did, uh, played Rake It Up and Down in the DM and then he had so much fun, he's like, let's go in the studio. So we went in the studio and, uh, and we made Loaded one night. I had the track, like I knew exactly what I wanted yeah. him to do. I wanted to just make like a really like classic, like funk, like like baseline house record, you know, and and um, that track I'd always had and been playing it out and it always works as like an opening track, like in the beginning of the night, really gets the crowd going. So I thought, all right, I'm just gonna play it for him and hopefully he'll not, uh, hopefully he'll vibe with it. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. And immediately, like he started like, like moving his shoulder oh. and he was like feeling it like right off the bat and he just started humming a bunch of lyrics and we just messed around the studio all night and, and got it got yeah. it sorted. Yeah. How would you say your music has changed since the early songs you made? I think it's pretty much the same. I mean, I, I'm just figuring out how to work with the vocalist better, but I think overall it's just, you know, I just come back to the lyrics and the, and the melody of the song and just trying to make songs I can put into my set and play. You know, that's really my goal is like just making a record that I can play in my set. And so I think that the sound, I'm really honing in on what my sound is and I feel like I've kind of figured it out, you know, yeah. what, what, what I want to do of, of blending house and rap. Yeah. What do you think are the challenges that electronic music is facing? Electronic music? Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, I think it's the same always is that, you know, I think just a lot of people copy and they just kind of do the mm. same things. And, you know, the electronic music more than anything, kind of such a big part of it is the, is the sound. You know, the sound production. and Because so many people are good at making electronic music, but how do you stand out? How, what makes you different? And I think that, um, you know, just being original is, is a big part of it. And then just the stigma with you know, people what they just think electronic music is in their minds, that it's, um, you know, party music and it's just, you know, fad or whatever, whatever they think, you know, they don't understand the culture, like electronic music, it's like hip hop, it's like jazz, it's like rock, like it's here to stay forever. Yeah. And people just have to accept it. Yeah. Do you see like more and more electronic music crossing into pop? Like, do you think that's the way that it needs to be to grow to a bigger audience? No, I don't think it needs to be like that to grow to a bigger audience, but I think if anybody who makes music in 2018, there's electronic in it. You know, I'm sure even if you're in a four-piece rock band, when you go in the studio, I'm sure they're using Pro Tools, editing the drums, sound, synthesizer, so electronic music's really in, 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 embedded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> embedded in, in, in every part of music at this point. You yeah. know, if you're making music, there's some part of technology involved in making music today. Yeah. Do you actually think there are some advantages to like SoundCloud like being smaller and smaller and more electronic acts going straight to Spotify? Um, I mean, there's always advantages and disadvantages, but I think overall, like, eventually people will find the music. You know, if the music's good, they find it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's on SoundCloud, MySpace, or Spotify, like, it's going to get there. It's going to get to people somehow. I mean, Spotify is really cool, you know. I mean, it's pretty amazing that you can, you know, I mean, I have 30 million plays on Spotify. I don't even know how <laughs> that's even possible. <laughs> but it's so cool that you can go to one place and just everything's there. Yeah. And it's kind of become the standard, you know. So whatever they've done, they've managed to put it together the right way yeah Can especially with with itunes and apple being always being the leader in that and then these guys coming and just kind of taking it from them mm -hmm. can you describe it about your wife and your children <laughs> like what their what personalities or what they're into um well my wife is right now you know we're trying she wants to rebuild our house <laughs> so my wife's very into architecture right now art and architecture furniture but my wife's the best like I'm really lucky mm -hmm. um, and is my, she in music also no she likes like you know she's not in music but she likes like classic rock oh she likes like Grateful Dead and Neil Young like she thinks my music's kind of nuts 
<laughs> kind of the same with my kids too. I yeah. guess. I mean, my kids, my daughter, she's you know she plays a lot of sports. She's like really smart and reads and but she's kind of into pop. And then my son, he likes rock, and he's uh, into sports. And, yeah. What are their ages? Uh, nine and eleven. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So I think they think anything electronic music. Related is like my music. Oh, so you know, that's daddy's music. That's like daddy's. Stuff. <laughs> what would you say have been your biggest challenges so far? I mean, there's like a million of them, but you gotta just overcome them. You know, like when anyone puts up a wall, you just gotta go around it. Mm -hmm. You know, or go through it. But I mean, there's all every day. There's challenges. You know, whether it's trying to get somebody to work with in the studio, trying to find a new location to do a festival trying to rent uh, cruise ships mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always challenges but you know we always figure them out whether I guess they so say like where there's a will there's a way yeah how would you say you've grown as a person since when you started uh, I've, I've I mean I've grown in leaps and bounds I've learned so much I've learned how to deal with people um, you know always you know respecting artists and just trying to work with with the best artists but um I still got a ton more to learn, you know, every every day you learn you learn more every day. Yeah. Last question. What do you want to be remembered for? Um, I want to be remembered for giving people a good time. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Bye.